welcome to hindu lounge hindu lounge is the uh, is the weekly show brought to you by world hindu Con- by hindu pack which is an initiative of world hindu council of america we uh, talk about contemporary american issue hindu issues and today uh, we are going to talk about uh, afghanistan and as everyone knows afghanistan uh, you know the uh, post 911 when uh, osama bin laden taking uh, you know uh, control in afghanistan with the taliban uh, came and attacked uh, america and uh, brought down the twin towers and attacked uh, pentagon and uh, other places uh, as a response american troops uh, invaded afghanistan and brought about a democratically elected government in afghanistan now this has been going on for this is the longest war in the history of us and eventually and i think president uh, trump at one time said that he is going to uh, have a hard deadline at the end of the may to leave afghanistan and um, even and then president biden said that he was going to leave afghanistan by uh, by september so us troops are now leaving and when us troop leaves there's going to be a vacuum and afghanistan uh, the uh, you know is going to be in a turmoil we all know that afghanistan uh, the afghan government uh, has largely you know remained in power with a lot of uh, support from the united states so when afghanistan uh, when us troops leave afghanistan uh, the pa- uh, the pakistani forces and the Pakist- uh, pakistani supported taliban are already there uh, you know positioning themselves to uh, take power in afghanistan now whether they will succeed they won't succeed we don't know but by all estimates currently uh, they occupy 50% of the territory in afghanistan and they are going to likely to make more advances now america is not completely out of it because as you might have read in the news just a couple of days ago uh, the us uh, uh, conducted air strikes against uh, the uh, against the taliban and taliban are not happy about it and all of that so with me as always as he is every week is utsoda utso chakravarti and utsoda is the executive director of hindu pack and uh, he has done quite a bit of uh, research and studying um uh, you know of the afghanistan's history and today's show may actually look a little bit like a history lesson on afghanistan but there is a important history to be learned here right uh, there is because at one time uh, till very recently afghanistan was integral part of india it is only that when british took over and uh, you know at some point british uh, you know uh, created afghanistan as a you know as a separate kind of uh, entity but afghanistan was always integral part of india going back to mahabharat days uh and uh, where gandhari came from the region called gandhar which is in present day afghanistan and it seems like utsoda has now fixed his camera problems so now i welcome utsoda back and utsoda over to you introduce this great uh, uh you know uh, puzzle that afghanistan is going to be uh, for everyone uh and uh, tell us uh, uh, so welcome and uh, tell us about uh, uh tell us about uh, your views on afghanistan well thank you ajay bhai for that introduction and uh, as always uh, we are back with a very interesting show this week uh, as ajay bhai noted in the beginning uh, we lost all some of it in the music but this week we are going to discuss what is happening in afghanistan and its impact on the hindu community now you ask average person in america would ask but the hindu community is not that uh, present in afghanistan uh it's been uh, in small numbers over the last many decades so how does it impact the hindus and i think that's why we are here to discuss uh, because to know how it impacts hindus we have to understand the history of afghanistan and as ajay bhai noted the history of afghanistan actually is m- more connected to the indian subcontinent than to any other place uh, in, in or any other power influence in that region and and uh, you know many people would debate that but we are going to discuss how and why and why it is important for hindus to understand and analyze and be fully aware of what's going on in afghanistan today because it's a continuum of history and and that's why ajay bhai also warned you guys it's going to be i'm going to be discussing a lot of history uh, because you know somebody said if you don't know your past you won't be able to deal with the future uh so 
so Ajay, bhai, do you want to share the screen uh, and uh, we can start with the, or I can share the screen and we can start with the uh, brief history lesson on Afghanistan. Uh, your picture comes only in part of the screen and uh, I don't know why, but uh, we will have to figure as we go around, we'll have to figure out it's only covering to the, oh, I, I understand why it is. All right, I'll, I'll change it. Yeah, and now we are on the full screen. So now I'm going to share the slides that Usada referred to, and if it because and we are always listening to you. So if you guys think that um, uh, there's too much of uh, theoretical uh, history work going on, please uh, you know send us a text, uh, a chat with us, and we will will change the composition. This is your show as much as it's our show. We enjoy doing this, and we enjoy presenting it in a certain way. But we are always always listening uh, to you. So the, uh, I think, you know, the first couple of slides I have are actually, you might not have seen them, but I want to make a couple of announcements and I, I'll repeat them both at the beginning and at the end. The first announcement I have to make is that this is, uh, this is uh, you know, a call-in show and uh, please, I'm, I'm going to post the URL that you can use to join us and participate in the show. But more importantly, Utsuda, I want to make this announcement that today, oh, where did it go? Ah, uh, today we have a Hindu pact and American Hindus Against Defamation, which is our uh, anti-defamation uh, initiative, uh, which partners with uh, Dharma Civilization Foundation. And we are collaboratively putting together a, a webinar on Hindu Dvesha. It's a series. And today there is a webinar at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, where we are going to talk about anti-Semitism and Hindu Dvesha or Hindu phobia and the parallels between the two. And this is going to be a really interesting seminar. As you may remember, in the last webinar in this series, we had a Holocaust survivor who came uh, to this webinar series and narrated her experience of uh, you know surviving a Nazi occupation and surviving in the concentration camp. And this is a continuation of that. We are going to have a representative from Jewish community and uh, some, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kalyan Vishwanathanji from Dharma Civilization Foundation, Dr. Jay Bansal from the uh, Hindu Pact and AHAD. Uh, and they're going to do a uh, talk about how, uh, what are the lessons for that uh, the that the Jewish uh, people have learned in last couple of centuries in America and what can Hindus learn from that in countering Hindu phobia. And so that webinar it takes place today. Uh, so that, uh, and the other announcement I have is uh, that we are going to have a, uh, we are going to have a, uh, uh, a Hindu pact gala that is coming up and we will be this gala will be uh, taking place in, uh, in in August so uh, on August 22nd so so that i do have a small video i will play that video later but for now i just want to make those two announcements and now over to you as you talk about afghanistan so so that walk us through the maps that you have so diligently put together go for it so Ajibai, the, as you can see the map, I start with uh, going back to what uh, most of the global community would start off with about uh, 600 uh, years BCE, uh, which is when, you know, the most of the civilizations in the Middle East and the Euphrates River uh, Valley were forming up. And you can see how the this, this period was actually quite a vibrant period for the Indian subcontinent. You had the uh, very well established uh, the Hindu uh, societies coming up. And these were urban Hindu societies, uh, uh, you can see in the map. And if you notice, the Afghanistan was very much uh, part of uh, the Hindu civilizational narrative at that point, going back uh, 600, 700 years uh, in, before the common era. And you will see that India actually were, was a conglomeration of uh, small states something that you know western democracies uh, take pride in today uh, or even credit the the greeks for but you can see these were all janpads and 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 that's a that's a, a democratic federation of states that were pretty much prevalent in all the uh, deforested areas if i can put it that way because you know this was early 
civilizational uh, growth period a lot of you know indian subcontinent being a tropical region uh, was very heavily forested so you had a very good urban setup in the ganges gangetic river valley as well as the the river valley of the sindhu saraswati uh, area so you see here kamboj and gandhar and kashmir all in in a line as part of these urban centers and then of course you have the the coastal uh, areas that were highly developed so if you ajay if you go back to the next slide uh, which goes takes a journey forward uh, another 100 years or so i believe so the next slide ajay bhai and that you see the first uh, persian empires forming up so the achaemenid empire is when zoroastrianism uh, started uh, reaching its uh, peak and this is also the empire which was in direct conflict and actually dominant over the greek period greek empires so when the western civilizational narrative was in, firmly in the control of early greeks uh, and and the persian empire the achaemenids uh, the zoroastrian kingdom Uh, Darius, Cyrus, the famous kings—they were also, by the way, proto-Vedic. So we, we are not trying to portray them as a separate civilization. They were actually part of the Vedic uh, civilizational narrative. If you read Itihas, you will see how closely they were associated with the Hindu civilization. But again, if you see here that yellow stretch all the way from Afghanistan through Kashmir, through the Indus Valley, Sindh. and then the entire coastal region and gangetic region of india as well as the narmada valley so you will see that this continues you know every 100 years i'm going to show you ma a map every 100 years trying to show drive the point how closely afghan civilization is connected to the hindu civilization and to india what what we believe as india today in the geographical context so next slide ajay bhai so ajay bhai next slide uh, yeah and now uh, you know i am entering a territory which is uh, probably many of you are very well familiar with because of one of the greatest minds of history and and continues to be today and that is uh, uh, kautilya or or vishnugupta chanakya one of the greatest minds in statecraft one of the greatest minds in in law giving uh, you know it 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 takes a special mine and a special genius to be relevant 2000 and 200 300 years after you are gone and and, and you were you were still not a, a prophet as the westerners would call them and so vishnugupta chanakya's period comes up in this is time and and you know they will that people can challenge us on the timeline here i am going why what is the western narrative on the timelines of course there are conflicting narratives and uh, there are there has been a lot of research done which kind of predates these uh, instead of 272 bc it could be you know a uh, 1000 bc it, it can be shifted back another 600 years according to some historians so uh, i i i admit that this is following a western narrative of timelines but and that can be challenged but this is the this is a larger geographical entity that existed during the mauryan empire and if you see now even here Uh, what you see on the leftmost corner of the Seljukid Empire is uh, the rightmost corner of the Seljukid Empire is Afghanistan, and it's very directly under the influence of the Hindu rulers or, or the Mauryan kings. Uh, next slide, Ajay Bhai. So here you see, uh, you know, the the again the how when the Mauryan Empire split up, uh, and this is probably the probably one of the peak periods of. Uh, hindu influence in that region uh, even though they were smaller kingdoms uh, you will see the the parthian empire which is again a proto vedic empire uh, which which is currently western pakistan and and iran but again you will see here that kapisa is afghanistan and and the entire region further up north so you know uzbekistan tajikistan all that area takshila all that area is part of the hindu civilizational narrative and and very much part of the uh, indian as we call it civilizational line indic civilizational identity uh, ajay bhai move move to the next slide ajay bhai to the next slide so uh, did you just say that kapisa is the modern day afghanistan it's it's the border region between uh, between pakistan and afghanistan today so you know the hindukush mountains 
were never like fully a proper border and it moved back and forth. So, you know, even today, the Pashtuns believe that you know, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is very much part of Afghan identity. Uh, so, yeah, Kapisa was at that time uh, part of what is present day Afghanistan, Pakistan region. And then okay. you see, uh, same, then you see uh, the Kushan Empire. Uh, you know, th this is moving forward into the common era. So I jump forward about 400 years, and Kushan King Kanishka, you know, the, the famous Kanishka, uh, one of the greatest Indian kings. Uh, you know, you must have heard, you remember the Air India plane that was taken down by the Khalistani terrorist uh, was named Kanishka. So Kanishka is very much a part of the Hindu, Hindu Indic civilizational narrative. Uh, even though Kanishka himself was a, a Mahayana Buddhist and uh, and probably one of the key kings who influenced in 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 re-Hinduizing Bodha traditions uh, uh, in the form of the third Buddhist council, I think that's what Kanishka did. I'm, I'm not sure whether okay. it was third or fourth. So that, that's so only that, if you only consider Buddhist tradition to be separate. So I would not say, I would not say, you know, uh, reintegrating them into Hinduism. I would just say that uh, they started adopting more of uh, the older Hindu practices uh, rather than saying that uh, they uh, they uh, got back to Hindu fold or something like that because yeah. they never really left the Hindu fold. Yeah. Buddha yeah. himself always said that he was uh, he was a Kapila Muni. He never said that he was a Buddhist. So yeah. I think um, I, I I would I would challenge that part. But the rest of it, I I do agree with you. No, no, I I, I agree with you, Ajay. Bhai. I the reason why I say it is because during Kanishka's time itself, Kanishka was blamed of uh, reintroducing. Uh, as as the other uh, the Theravada Buddhists would claim in those days, I'm not talking about today's context. This is you know this is happening 1800 uh, years ago. So sure, so this, is, sure. this, is, this is before uh, the the European world knew about the Bible. So <laughs> this is that uh, long. So next next slide, Ajabai. Okay, uh -huh. and, and and you can see here how how much the Silk Route is directly connected. It's not just Afghanistan. It's the entire Silk Route that is directly connected to uh, to the Indic civilization and the Hindu Hindu civilizational narrative. So here we go on in, into the more, you know, post uh, in the classical Hindu period, the Gupta Empire. And again, you can see the Zoroastrian Sassanid Empire is, which is Iran and Western Pak in Balochistan and 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 a little bit uh, of Afghanistan as part of the Zoroastrian Empire. And then you have the Huns, uh, who are Huns, by the way, were followers of Bhagwan Shiv. They were ethnically not Indian, but again, Indian ethnicity itself is is a diversity of multiple ethnicities. So, Huns were actually uh, pro proto-European, uh, you know, European uh, uh, origin, Indo-European in in uh, ethnicity, but uh, and so were the Hephthalites. But they were very much part of the Indic tradition because they embraced Hindu dharma and they practiced Hindu dharma. They were followers of Lord Shiva. They built beautiful statues and artifacts in uh, honor of Hindu deities. Again, you can see how Afghan, Afghanistan, Central Asia is totally connected to this Indic narrative. And, and so that once again, uh, the Hindu dharma is becoming uh, more popular in the West. So life goes full circle, right? Life goes full circle. And that's why it's called Sanatan dharma. You really have to work that's hard. Right. To, yeah, it, its roots are deep. And, you know, Heptalites were called the the White Huns, so they were, the, you know, they were a clan of, uh, I believe, pre-Turkic communities in in the Central Asian region, and and right. then of course you have the Huns, who were the Indo Huns. They were fully Indianized, uh, and that that's the group that ruled Afghanistan. So and now, now we come to a period where uh, the you know uh, at six twenty nine uh, CE and uh, the Turkish Empire is beginning to build up. So this is interesting because this Turkish empire is also a Hindu Buddhist empire. So this right. Turkish Kaganet, this is not the modern Turkish empire because the modern Turkish Correct. empire in those days was actually Anatolia, which is part of Greek uh, empire. So this Tur this is actually the original uh, ethnicity from where Turks originated. And then I'll show you how they moved westwards. That's probably a show in itself. But again, you can see here, this is the time when Islam is just beginning in Arabia, just beginning. Muhammad is just beginning to fight his fight battles. So, uh, so, so that one thing I want to point out, and that is that many people forget that Chinggis Khan himself was not a Muslim. Uh, oh, no, no. He, Chinggis Khan, Chinggis Khan's, he was, uh, yeah. 
Chinggis Khan, yeah, if there is yeah. one person responsible for for doing the most damage to Islamic Islamic caliphates and Islam as, yeah. as a belief, the Chinggis Khan and the next two generations of Chinggis Khan, go, going all the way up to uh, Ulaku Khan, who was the grandson of Chinggis Khan. Uh, yeah. These three individuals did the most damage and destruction to Islamic caliphates. And had they not done it, I, I believe personally that not only most of Europe, but also the entire Indian subcontinent would have been fully part of the Islamic caliphates. I'm not Islamic kings because Islamic kings ruled over Indian subcontinent for a long time. But the caliphates would have taken over India as well directly. So, so the Chinggis Khan has a, has has a lot of uh, you know historical re relevance. But you here you see just around the time Islam is beginning in the Middle East, you see Kabul Kabul is fully part of the Indic Indic narrative. Zabul Kabul, you know you see this entire area. Taksha Taksha is you know Taksha Shila area. Jammu and Kashmir, you know what is present day Jammu and Kashmir, and Tibet is now beginning to emerge as part of the Indic civilizational narrative as well, and. This is this is about uh, the time Islam just begins in the Middle East. So the Western Turkish Khaganate, as you know, see the purple up there, is also actually a Dharmic uh, entity. It's not a Muslim entity at that time. The, the Turks started off as Hindus and Buddhists. So next slide, Ajay. Bhai. Now you're beginning. To, you're beginning to see the, you know, the the solidification of the civilizational narratives as we look at it today. What you see is now Islam has taken over entire Zoroastrian Persian Empire, and now it's the Rashidun Caliphate. So this is this is within the first 20 years of Islam's uh, growth. So this is right after Muhammad. And the first caliphate is emerging, and you know that was the time when they literally, completely ran through the uh, Persian Empire and 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 completely destroyed it. Uh, so you see the Rashidun Caliphate here. What is interesting is that you still see Kabul, Zabul, and all that region, Taksha, as fully integrated into the Hindu civilization narrative. So I'm going, to, I'm walking through you in, in the last ten minutes. I've walked through the thousand years of history of Afghanistan. And you see how in every 100 year interval, 200 year interval that I'm showing the map, you see how much it is integral to the Hindu civilizational narrative and the Indic civilizational narrative. And now you see how, you know, the Tur Tibet, again, this is still Western Turkic Khaganate. In fact, Western Turkish Khaganate was still Hindu and Buddhist. Uh, the Persian Zoroastrian kings actually escaped into the Turkish Khaganate and were supported by the Khaganate at that time. So some of the Hindu kings in the uh, in the Kabul region, some of the Hindu kings in Taksha region were also now beginning to support and help the refugees who were escaping Iran to flee Islamic persecution, who were Zoroastrians. So this is this is the period when this starts happening. Next slide, please, Ajay. Uh, yeah, the next slide, Ajay. Thank you, thank you, Amitabhji, for uh, the suggestion. I will, uh, yeah, Ajay Bhai is working on the slide. The new streaming uh, uh, service that we are using, uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Vandana Sharma ji who has joined as well. Thank you, Vandana ji, uh, as always. And uh, I, I'll make it bigger and see if it helps, uh, but. Putting it completely in slideshow mode is a little bit of a problem uh, because then going to the next slide, when Utsada says, oh, go skip two slides, I don't know what I'm skipping. So Amitabh ji, let me know if this works better. Uh, all right, Utsada, on to the next slide. Yes, please. Okay. So we are now beginning, beginning to see the emergence of Islam uh, and we went through the last thousand years of Afghanistan's history in context of the rest of the Indic civilization and the surrounding region. And now we are 100 years or so, 120 years or so after the beginning of Islam. And that's when Islam has now conquered North Africa and it has conquered Syria and the entire Egyptian civilization, the entire Syrian 
uh, Euphrates, Tig Tigris Valley civilization has now been conquered by Islam. And Iran, the Zoroastrian Iran, Proto-Vedic Iran has now completely fallen to Islam. You still see, this is 693 common era. You still see Kabul, Zabul, and the surrounding Tajik, Uzbek region still fully part of the Hindu civilizational, Indic civilizational narrative here. So it's Tibet. But now you begin to see a, a, a void emerging in the Silk Road region in, in Central Asia. And if you go to the next slide, you will now begin, begin to see how that void is getting filled. Uh, just one second, Utsada. Yes. I just wanted to put this caption for people who are just kind of uh, have the uh, sound kind of on a low or whatever. But what Utsada said, I just put it as a caption here that all of the Hindu, uh, Afghan, Afghanistan is part of the uh, greater Hindu civilization, Indian civilization uh, in 693 uh, uh, CE. Okay. And so, now we uh, now we go to the next one. And uh, so that in uh, in reality, I mean, uh, the uh, Afghans, uh, you know, people who lived in that region resisted the Islamic, uh, you know, uh, assault for a long time. It, it didn't happen overnight. That, that region was not overnight converted. And uh, there is a, you know, and we should, uh, I'm, I'm sure you are going to go through this, but uh, regions, and we talked about it, so I know you're going to cover it, but uh, there are regions like Hindu Kush and Kafiristan in Afghanistan have significance and the reason they're named the way they are named, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, so now we have, seen, we, have, we, have, we have seen from, we have seen about a hundred years of journey now since the beginning of Islam and already the second Islamic Caliphate is beginning to end now. So the, you saw the Rashidun Caliphate in the two maps before, and then you saw the Umayyad Caliphate. So the first Caliphate is gone. Mm -hmm. The second Caliphate is now at its peak. And still Afghanistan and the surrounding region are fully part of the Hindu empire. So you have seen the first hundred years of Islam and, and still they are resisting. In fact, in the, if you see this statue, this is, this is the, these statues were built around, uh, you know, th at that time. This is Lord, Lord Vishnu. Along with the Varaha and the Narsima avatars, you know, you'll see on the sides, the Narsima head as well as uh, Varaha head of Lord Vishnu with the Sudarshan Chakra and a conch shell in his hand. This is from Kabul area. And in fact, uh, if I can say an anecdote, uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, when a, a lot of Hindus were murdered by the, the ISIS in Afghanistan, unfortunately, uh, I had, under very sad circumstances, the opportunity and the chance to meet uh, the ambassador of Afghanistan to America in the Washington, D.C. And, you know, he was very happy to receive uh, a portrait of Lord Vishnu and he put it behind his desk. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 he said, he, he, the Afghans know and, and I, I'm pretty sure the Pakistanis know as well. They just don't want to admit it that this is one of the glorious pe periods of their history. And, and they were far, far more resilient, resilient than we give them credit for. And that is part of our mistake because as Hindus, we really don't know anything about them. I, mean, I can guarantee you that most Hindu Americans and most Hindus in India actually have no idea of what I was showing over the past 20 minutes. I went through a journey of the past thousand years of Afghanistan from 600 BC to 700, you know, 1100 years. And you see a continuum of civilizational connect to Hindu civilization and Hindu civilization being very much there in full, in its full glory. So next slide, Ajayman. Hey, so I want to just point out one more thing, and that is uh, the Bamiyan Buddhist uh, statue also stood uh, for uh, you know, a couple of thousand years, right? And Correct. that is as much a part of uh, the Afghan Buddhist heritage uh, as is all the uh, you know other mainstream uh, Hindu thoughts, whether they're uh, Shaivite and Vaishnavite and uh, Buddhist. And the, all of these traditions uh, survived in Afghanistan for a very, very long time. And in fact, uh, it was I'm not too long ago that Taliban actually destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhist uh, statue, which was one of the long, uh, which was one of the tallest. Uh, Buddha statues in the world and one of the most ancient, uh, it, uh, the entire mountainside, right? And they, it took them several days of blasting 
um, to destroy the uh, statue. And, uh, you know, what a loss for the whole world. But just as you're pointing out with this uh, uh, Vishnu Bhagwan uh, Murti, uh, the Bamiyan Buddhist Murti also, uh, you know, uh, was an inherent part of the Afghani culture. Oh, absolutely. And when I when I say that part of the Hindu civilizational narrative, the thousand years that I show, especially under the Kushans, which was a period of about 200, 300 years uh, of those 1100 years, uh, Afghanistan, the king was Buddhist. Uh, so, so this is the re the most interesting part that Western scholars will never accept or probably re just refuse to accept, is that Hindu tradition, the orthodox Hindu traditions and the heterodox Hindu traditions in the form of Buddhist traditions were so interlinked that it was, you know, in a Western world, if there is a, there is a very cheap com uh, you know, comparison I can make, it's like the Methodist and the evangel and the, and the Episcopalian. It's, it's that close. It's, it's a denominational interaction rather than a different religion. And that's the part that Western scholars don't want to talk about and they will probably never talk about because they want to continuously show that Hindus and Buddhists were different uh, in, even in the past. So, so as you can see, like most of Afghanistan was this way. It was, you know, Buddha was just one more deity and, and, and the philosophy was very much part of the civilization itself. So uh, next slide, Ajay Bhai. So now actually I'm going to start to show you uh, temples, images of temples that I'm pretty sure most of you don't recognize. And the reason most of you don't recognize these temples because these are temples that are in current day Pakistan. But where so they... Now, hold on. Yes. Please um, put this as a quiz and answer after a couple of minutes. So tell us all about this mandir. And we will wait for a couple of minutes. We'll wait for the people to respond on the chat. Uh, and uh, we'll see what people come up with. Uh, let's uh, let... Uh, tell us all about this mandir without giving the name and where it is located. Okay. So these mandirs were built by the Afghan Turkic Shahi dynasty. So if you see the last slide I showed on Afghanistan, you saw uh, when, when the Umayyad Caliphate is, is, you know, the eastern edge of the Umayyad Caliphate, you have something, a part of the map called the Shahi uh, rulers. The Shahis were basically Hindu kings, but they were not Indian ethnically. You know, when I say Indian, means they, they didn't come from the Indian ethnic backgrounds. They were actually Turkic ethnically. So they were Turkic Hindu kings who were called Hindu Shahis historically. There, that's how they've been termed. And they built these temples, and and uh, so these are called the Hindu Shahi temples. Uh, if you can, you know, guess where these temples are located, and these are, these are located all uh, in in a series in in a couple of you know, 100 square mile region. So if you can name, I don't know if most people know this, but again, we have, Ajay, I wanted to make it a quiz. So uh, I was going to make, give it an easier question, but if people can guess where these temples are located, uh, you know, I, I will take an answer. Name this mandir and where is the, these these mandirs these are actually two different temples Ajay, but they're very close in close proximity. Right, they're very close by. So, so but we're gonna, I'm going to pose it again. Uh, these are the man uh, please name these mandirs. Uh, they're built by Shahi kings and tell us where they are located. And we will come back in uh, after uh, after a couple of minutes and we'll give the answer. So okay. here is a challenge for our viewers: What are these mandirs and where are they located? Uh, you know, so that in one of these shows, we should start announcing uh, some prizes and actually give the prizes away. Um, I think I can do that. I, you know, uh, we have some good books and all that that we can start, uh, you know, uh, giving to people for answering questions like this. Uh, not quite ready yet. I have one answer on the chat. Let's see what the chat says. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, Preeti Ji is saying that uh, this is located in Pakistan, but we need a little bit more than that because Utsada already said it's located in Pakistan. You have to tell us where it is located and in Pakistan, okay? And what is what temple is this? Uh, Sanatani Hindu is saying, is it located in Kabul? Yeah. All right. So we got two answers. So the, I think I think uh, uh, you know I am. Uh, uh, so the, I think at this stage you have to reveal 
where are these mandirs located what mandirs are what mandirs are these so i am going to put the screen up one more time um, i'm sorry i took it away uh, my you know my my fault but here is the here is the screen again the share and with so that um oops sorry again my mistake i keep turning this off but let me turn it on also now tell us where are these mandirs uh, what are these mandirs where are these located so okay so the, the these temples are hey, wait wait one more answer one more answer before we go uh uh amita mithal ji is saying these are located in abbottabad it's very close it's it's very close very close uh, yeah it's a so this this uh, these temples are actually located at the meeting point of the hindu kush mountains with the slightly smaller salt range mountains of pakistan present day pakistan and the one on the right side is called uh, the exact location is called kafir kot uh, as you can see the name st- speaks for itself it's the place where kafirs live or it's a fort where kafirs live so on the so these are these are called the salt range temples and they stretch across eastern pakistan near rawalpindi area where the hindu kush and the salt range mountains meet and and abbottabad is very close to rawalpindi so i'll i'll give amitabh ji uh, credit for for uh, partial credit uh, pa- uh, partial credit right or full partial. credit no full credit <laughs> uh, i mean he I, the fact that people actually are responding is is a very good thing i'm very very happy to hear that. absolutely absolutely so amitabh ji uh, thank you very much for taking part uh, utsada is a very generous uh, grader so he gives you full credit for this i think you deserve it too uh, so thank you thanks for the response i think there are more of these coming up right yes uh, the, the next one is easier question the next question is easier uh, amitabh ji actually even said no share uh, and uh, then uh, uh, i'm i'm just going to play some chat uh, so uh wow well, and then priti pandya ji said congratulations amitabh so amitabh thank you all right going on to the next slide so the okay another another temple so uh, where is so this, this uh, where is this uh, hold on uh, let's po- uh, tell us about it and then uh, we will pose it as a question okay so tell us about this uh, mandir okay so this is a photograph of a very famous mandir uh this was taken in 1862 okay so it's more than 150 years old now and uh, this photograph is of a very famous site but this is not in in afghanistan or nor was it built by the afghan shahi hindu kings uh, it was actually built by the kashmiri hindu kings who by this time actually were intermarrying with afghan hindu kings so the turkic shahi dynasty in afghanistan was actually intermarrying with the kashmiri kingdom by this time so this is a very very famous temple at least in our in our hearts and souls and we all love to speak about this place Thank yeah you. I, I, so the, this is the temple about which everyone talks about right Correct. but nobody i don't know how many people have actually seen the pictures and how many pictures people have seen the pictures today but this is the temple that everyone talks about so what temple is it and where is it located so let's see uh preeti ji is saying it is a badrinath temple i am afraid that's not the that's not the badrinath temple um i i i know uh, any other guesses this is a very very famous temple i mean this this particular mandir has a civilizational value right even uh, today, so here is amitabh ji's answer uh he is saying that this is a uh, martan sun temple i don't think so amitabh ji no but uh, amitabh ji you are you are you are dealing with kashmiri hindu kings now so you are you are getting there uh, you are getting there you are close the lalita aditya muktipeed was uh, the one who built the wait, martan wait 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 jay bansal ji has an answer hold on hold on hold on yes and that is the answer This, so this is the Sharda Peet Mandir. This is the Sharda Peet Mandir from 150 years ago. From 150 years ago. 
Yes. And no, this is uh, Sanat- sorry, there was Sanatani Hindu who said Martha and Sun Temple, not Amitabh Ji. I'm sorry. I I, I misread it. So sorry about that, Amitabh Ji. Uh, and uh, Sanatani Hindu, uh, thank you. But uh, you know, close but not quite. And Jai Ji, absolutely, you're right. Uh, this is, this so is how does this temple look like today? So here is what it looks like today, right? Oh, no, not no, here. We, we didn't took the, take the picture. Oh, I, we, I, didn't, we didn't put the picture on the slide. Yeah, uh, we should show the picture. It's a really, it breaks uh, my heart it, to put it there. We, yeah, it is. Uh, it's a heartbreaking picture to um, to show how it looks today. Uh, it is, you know, uh, a stone pillar standing there with people loitering around. Uh, that is the picture we found, and we figured, you know, we don't really want to. We don't really want to show that picture. Yeah, so we didn't I, show I that did, picture, I but did, um, did, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Jaiji is saying that uh, you know, uh, Amitabh ji is saying that he didn't reply because it would be unfair. Uh, and uh, he he didn't know the answer, so I I I, I absolutely believe that. And JG is saying that hey, they have actually built urinals in it. Um, by the way, for anyone who wants to dial in, I I am going to put up a link here, and you guys, uh, you guys can just join this. Uh, we are not using Zoom anymore; we are using a different software. But I would be glad to. Uh, I I'm going to put a link here, so feel free to participate in the show as well. Because this is a participatory show. We always welcome everyone to join. Uh, please please feel free to call. Uh, otherwise, Utsada, here is the next slide. And uh, continue because we need to get to the current events as well. And we have a lot to talk about about the current events and what are the implications of Hindus. Because we are just walking people through the history of Afghanistan. And we haven't even hit the current events. We haven't even gone, gone to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We haven't talked about Durant line. There's, so there's a lot more to come. So please go for it. So, so this the is the time. The reason, time the reason I, I'm focusing more on this this part of the presentation is because this is the part that most people do not know about, and it is right. it is really important for Hindus to know about this because it, because it is their own history. <laughs> And 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 that's the. By the way, Maya Durga just joined, and uh, Maya, hey, Maya. Durga wanted to say hello to everybody. Uh, Namaste, and thank Maya. You guys, Maya Durga Namaste. has been watching me uh, put together these maps uh, forever. So I think she should she should get a something. I didn't have a PhD. I don't have a PhD, but she should get a PhD for doing Absolutely. it. <laughs> so, so, so the, uh, you know what what is the. Uh, Abbasid Calif- Caliphate okay. and what is Gurjara Kingdom? Let's talk about that because Gurjara has actually went all the way up to Afghanistan, right? Close to it. The, the, quite. The, the ethnicities are were all over the place, but this was right. This is roughly the region that they were ruling, and uh, including the present day state of Gujarat. But what is very interesting in this map, and people should this is when people should start focusing on what's happening to the civilizational na- Hindu civilization here. You see in the map on the bottom left, Sindh is now part of Abbasid Caliphate. So one of the most important Hindu uh, urban centers, Hindu civilizational centers, that is Sindh, is now part of the Abbasid Caliphate and has has been t- taken over by Abbasid. By the way, Abbasid Caliphate is the third caliphate. So Islam is now in full control of southern Europe. In, in the middle of France by this time, they have they have reached the Pyrenees mountain. They have taken full control of North Africa. They are on the gates of Constantinople, which is the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire. They have taken full control of the Middle East. And now they are beginning to move into the Dharmic civilizational area. And Sindh is now fully part of the Islamic Caliphate. But you still see, uh, go back, you still see Kabul and, and, and Afghanistan as part of the Hindu civilization. So, yep. so, so the, you see the Taksha area. The, so, Kabul, Zabul, and the surrounding areas are still part of the Hindu civilization. And now, if you go to the next slide, uh, and this is almost 300 years after Islam has taken full control, you see that the caliphates have broken up. The, now, Islam and the Arab control of Islam is falling apart. And now, the converted people. The Persians, the Central Asian, who have now who have been now been three, four generations, five generations converted to Islam, but are not Arabs, they are taking control of Islam now. So the Samanids, the Saf- Safarids, the Buids, Buids are by the way Shias, and and Islamic schism has fully taken place. Now you begin to see the Ghaznavids. 
come up. And now Afghanistan is beginning to lose to Islam. So we made a journey of almost 1300 years in this presentation that I'm giving today, where you had a continuous 1300 years of Hindu civilization in the region. And now you are beginning to see the Ghaznavids taking root here. And the Ghaznavids were Turkic slaves. You know, the, they, were, the, they were Turkic Hindus and Buddhists who had been converted to Islam by the Arabs. And now they are beginning to take control of Islam and push forward with their military agenda on behalf of Islam. So if you go to the next slide, Ajay Bhai. So um, Vanna Ji is saying that uh, uh, our national anthem still has sin. And that is true because Vanna Ji, when we talk about, uh, the, uh, when we talk about Bharat, uh, we talk about Bharat uh, that is not the geographical region that is defined by, or a political region as is defined by today, but we are talking about uh, Bharat as it should be. And that includes... Uh, you know, that includes Sindh, that includes Afghanistan, that includes the uh, western part of Punjab, and that includes the eastern part of Bang uh, of Bengal. It also, it, it, it stretches all the way from Min Myanmar to the borders of Iran and from Afghanistan to the southernmost borders of India. And that is the true Bharat. And if, when you sing the praise of that land, it includes, uh, it, naturally it includes Sindh. And it is only temporarily for last maybe 70 years, 72 years, that Sindh is not part of the same political entity. That is not, that does not take Sindh away from Bharat Varsha or the greater Bharat. So I think that's, a, it's a political compulsion in many ways that Sindh is today not part of Bharat. And right. that is why, you know, uh, sin should be part of our national anthem, and it is. Correct. And now if you go to or the... Indian next... national anthem, I should say, because a lot of us are American citizens. So it is the part of Indian national anthem, as it should be. Correct. So now if you if you go to the next slide, Ajabai, uh, you, you're beginning to see the slow takeover of, of Afghanistan uh, and the northern part of, northwestern part of what is India today by Islamic empire. So now this is 1196. So now we have journeyed about 1500 years <coughs> in our presentation, Six, almost 1600 years in our presentation. And now you see a complete takeover of Islam, not just in Afghanistan, but also in the Gangetic plain of Indian subcontinent. So the Indus Valley, the, the an, most ancient Hindu civilizational areas are now falling to Islam. And you see, so you, you pretty much see that by the time Northern India fell to Islam and the time Afghanistan fell to Islam, there was a very short period of time between that. So, you know, this is something I want people to understand. Afghanistan did not fall to Islam too long before Delhi fell to Islam. You have to understand that because this is how you we, it, we need to rewire our minds so that we can recalibrate our approach to the region and how we perceive it. And that's why I'm, I'm showing these maps. And I, I you know, Ajabai was very skeptical. Why are you going back thousand years of history? Because we should talk about Taliban today. But this is important. We can talk about Taliban as much as we want. But our minds need to be rewired to understand our own history. And now you begin to see the Gorid Empire. But, but only in interest of time. Because, uh, you know, I know you're very passionate about it. Uh, usually you're the one who is reminding me of time. But I just want to let you know that... Uh, today's show is worth two shows, and and for I, good I reason. Know. Today, today I have not not once I have mentioned the the clock because this is. Something I know. I, I, I can see that. Uh, I, I I absolutely I, I see that. So <laughs> let's keep going. We'll not worry about the clock today. Uh, for people who want to catch up later on, we fully understand. Not everyone can stay uh, for a long time. That you know, as long as we are doing the show, but. You know, the recording is available on YouTube. It's all on Facebook. But this is an important part of history that we are covering today. So by all means, please, uh, you know, stay if you can. Uh, watch it uh, recorded if you can. But this is the kind of information that I doubt you're going to get anywhere else. So please, please do, um, you know, uh, stay and uh, at, at some point or the other watch this because this is really important. Uh, we are also going to have uh, really interesting uh, regular segments. But after the history... We'll have quite a bit of discussion about the current situation in Afghanistan and what happens when U.S. actually leaves and uh, and how should the Hindus 
uh, how should America, how should India, how should people in Canada, because there's a news item that came out recently about Canada, uh, Hindus in Canada, Hindus and Sikhs in Canada requesting Canadian government to provide assistance to the minorities over there. That is the news from yesterday. So we'll talk all about that. But for now, let's continue with the history of Afghanistan and then tie it to uh, the, uh, you know, try it to the current situation over there. So that continuing on the next slide. So, so now you see the Gori, Muhammad Ghori and the Ghori Empire take over. And now you see the beginning to see the Islamization of Northern India. Not just Northern India, what you see is that now Islam is fully established in the Gangetic Plain. So the Indus Valley and the Gangetic Plain are now fully <laughs> under Islamic rule. Not just that, if you go back, the Ilkhanate, which is a Mongol uh, kingdom, which was established by Ch Genghis Khan's grandson, uh, Hulaku Khan, has now been converted to Islam as well. So what, what happened in this period is, what you see here as part of the Islamic thing, which is the Ilkhanate, the Delhi Sultanate, and the Bengal Sultanate, all these people are actually not Arabs. They are fourth or fifth generation Turkics who have been converted from Hindu Dharma. So now you, you see that uh, Ilkhanates are actually Mongol converts. No, so so they are no, not. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say the Mongol converts and Mongols. Well, the Mongols also practiced. Yeah, Mongols also practiced uh, uh, the religion that would today come very close to Sanatan Dharm. They would be considered Sanatanis or you know Dharmic mm -hmm. in today's kind of, uh, relevance. Actually, uh, so the uh, uh, you know Mongolia is ninety-seven percent Buddhist today. So, it is 97% uh, Buddhist today, but these are Mongols who were not necessarily Buddhist. They were heavy, they, they, were, were, they were following the, uh, their own uh, traditional religion at the time. Uh, and actually, you know, people actually get, uh, people think that Khan uh, is a Muslim last name. Now, a lot of Muslims have Khan as last name, but actually Khan just means king who ruled or, or an uh, emperor who ruled over the mountainous regions. A loose, loose translation. So a mount, uh, you know. So, so basically, you know, mountains of Mongolia are the plain. Uh, in, you know, in, uh, 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 if you were a tribal king, you would get the title of Khan. And today, it is so tightly, uh, you know, tied to uh, the is, uh, uh, Islamic faith. But it's really, not, it's, it's really a Mongol uh, last name, and not even last name, uh, honorific. Yeah, it's a Mongol honorific, and and not just that, the, the Khan in China becomes Han. So Kublai Khan in China became Hublai Han. Kublai Khan would be another uh, descendant of... Uh, so so Mongols spread in because they conquered so fast and they almost extinguished Islam uh, completely. So Kublai, uh, uh, Kulaku Khan ravaged Baghdad and completely destroyed the Islamic caliphates, uh, in, including the Abbas, what was left of the Abbasid Caliphate. And he sought help from the Pope and he himself was a Devi worshipper, by the way, you know, Mother God is Devi worshipper. So he sought help from the Pope, who was by that time con controlling the Lebanon, Levant, Levant region, you know, uh, even is though Islam had conquered that entire Syrian uh, uh, coast, there were pockets which were controlled by, by the Christians. So when uh, when Hulaku Khan sought help from the Pope and said, this is our chance to dis defeat <clears throat> Islam once and for all, because the Islamic king, ha king had moved into Northern Africa and was ruling from Cairo at that time. That were, that's where they sought refuge. The Pope said, I do not work in partnership with heathens. And that was the biggest strategic mistake ever made by any European uh, thought leader or, or uh, leader, if you can put it that way, uh, because it was, it is going to come back and bite Europe for the rest of their future. And so it did it, it bite back us also. So then after that, the Mongols actually kept on trying to defeat the Muslims in Egypt. And there is a very famous battle in Egypt where between the descendants of the Turkic uh, slave, Hindu slaves who were Muslims by now called the Mamluks ruling from Egypt having a clash with the Mongols who were also Dharmics at the battle of uh, uh, Ain uh, Jalut that's how the you should all google this battle battle of Ain Jalut A-I-N-J-A-L-U-T 
I'm just throwing, growing off script a little bit, but do read up the Battle of Angelud because that has impacted human civilization. Sir, can you put the name? Uh, can you put the name in the uh, in the caption so that everyone can look it up? Yes, 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 yes. I, I should do that. I should do that. So it's called Battle of Angelut, and this is one of the most con- significant battles in human history because it is going to affect us forever. Because that's when. Angel- that's when you know the, the mongols were defeated by the muslims and islam survived and and then came back from there on so the battle of angelut so anyway by this time if you go forward you see now we are in the 15th, 16th century and now you see the safavid dynasty in iran which is a shia dynasty uh, completely controlling the middle east and now you have the children of the mongol converts so by this time, Islam is totally controlled and led by the children of converts who are third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation converts. And you have the Mughal Empire in India, the Bengal Sultanate, which is the remnants of the Turkic converts uh, to Islam. And, and then you have the Safavid dynasty, the Shia dynasty of Iran, also children of converts uh, going forward. But, but by this time, you see Afghanistan is completely in the hands of Muslims. So after a journey of about 1300 years that we went through, you see Afghanistan in Islamic control now. Forward, Ajay. So I just put that as text. So people who are just watching it get the context that at this stage in 1564, uh, Afghanistan uh, is pretty much uh, Islamic. But from our perspective, what is important to note is that it is still part of India is a, is, a, is part of what we consider Bharat Varsha. It is it, culturally and uh, you know in many other ways, it's part of the same country. That is true, but you have to understand that now India itself is wants to. Be India Persian. itself has changed. Yeah, but so but, but the important is part going... is that, uh, but uh, the important part here is that it is not that Afghanistan has become a. Culturally and everywhere, every other way, a different country. Correct. Because now Afghanistan wants to be Persian and so does Mughal India. Correct. So now, Pers- now everybody wants to be Persian now. So that, that is the civilization change that has happened in India at this point now. Right, right. So, I mean, they either, you know, but, but you know, what I was, what I was alluding to was that it's, you know, the, the kind of, Cultural, the culture that was evolving, whether it was influenced by Arabs or Turks or Persians, um, or even going back to either whether it was uh, the Gupta or the Maurya, Afghanistan was never different from most of the northern uh, and central India. Correct. It was. It was. It it, it followed the same uh, cultural uh, uh, underpinnings as rest of the northern and you know northwestern India. Absolutely. And that, that is the that is the takeaway, a very good observation, Ajay. Right? That's the takeaway from our presentation that, you know, it continues, even though now India itself is being Islamized and, and under control of Islam, so is Afghanistan. <laughs> so both are moving on the same journey in the timeline here. So the next step. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And now we come into a period which many people are very familiar with because now you you have heard stories from your own families. Now we get into the Maratha Confederacy and the Missal. Missal is the Sikh uh, kingdoms. Uh, and now you can see that now it has again started fragmenting this entire region. But now the Sikhs are in control of uh, uh, most of Afghanistan, in northern, eastern Afghanistan. And the rest of the western Afghanistan is now part of the the Persian slash uh, Turkic narrative that is so you the current ethnic identities the Uzbeks the the Hazaras the the Tajiks all these identities are now firming up in this region and now you are beginning to see a more modernized uh, concept of Afghanistan and this is by this time the colonial powers are beginning to come to India so the Portuguese are in India now the French and the British are are firmly in East India companies in India now. Uh, so now you see the Maratha Confederacy in the in the uh, the Sikh Missal. Uh, missal uh, means uh, you know uh, confer- confederates and uh, confederacies. 
firming up. And so if you go to the next slide, Ajay Bhai. Yeah, now you are in 1924 and firmly in the British era. And when you are in the British era, what you see is that the great game is in full play here. The Soviet Union is, is you know, is in full fl flare. They are the remnant of the Russian kingdom, uh, the Tsarist Russian kingdom. So basically the Marxists, when they took the revolution, they got in inheritance the Tsarist king, kingdom from Russia. And in between Soviet Union and the British is Afghanistan. And so when I, I took this date because this is the date when Tsarist Russia has its full foreign policy influence in place because the Russian Revolution has just happened. So you still have the Tsarist Russia's uh, foreign policy in place and you have the British colonial uh, empire in India. And in between these two empires are the Afghans. And Afghans are now the buffer state. Uh, in the great game. Now it's full on colonialism, full on post-industrial revolution uh, conquests have ha already happened. And now you, you are in the modern era. You are just after the first world war. Yep. And this is where, uh, so the, the uh, you know, uh, separation uh, engineered by British to create, for creating the buffer state is starting to emerge, right? This is where the Durand line is drawn and, uh, you know, the uh, Soviets also have these, uh, you know, border states uh, that they are using it as somewhat of a buffer, whether it's, uh, you know, all the way from Tajikistan and uh, Kazakhstan and all these other, uh, you know, the uh, states that border Afghanistan. And so Soviets have their own reason uh, for, and uh, British have their own reason for having Afghanistan as a buffer between the two. And both are, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the old uh, Lucknow tradition of both are saying Pale Aap. So both yeah. the British and the Soviet Union, Russians uh, are, are saying, because this is a post-industrial revolution army that both of them have. So both can actually go in and conquer Afghanistan if they want, but both know that they cannot stay there for that long because this is not a place where they can win for too long. So both are saying Pale Aap. The, the one who goes in first gets weaker first and the other one walks in. So both, both are not going in there because both know that there is, they, they are going to, somebody Correct. is going to take a big chunk out of their hand if they go in there. Yep. So, so next slide, Ajay. And so the, so now we are, you know, the, in, this is, this is a re, a representation of the, the British empire. This is basically where undivided India had an Afghanistan where, you know, during the, just around the time when partition happened. And, and you know, then we obviously know that Pakistan was created and then another chunk of land was taken out of the Indian civilization. And now Afghanistan and Pakistan are fully separated, you know, in the last hundred years of our history. Correct. Um, so that, and that, um, this, these are the, now the boundaries that, uh, you know, persist, right? Because then uh, the British India, uh, uh, the India that was ruled by British, it's never a British India, but India that was ruled by British uh, got uh, divided into India and Pakistan and eventually India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan became an independent country. Uh, so if you go, uh, so that now that we have the historical, uh, you know, context of this, uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which happened in 1979. So Afghanistan had a uh, king actually at one time who was the ruler, and that king was deposed, and the communists took over, uh, and then um, Soviet Union eventually invaded Afghanistan, and that invasion lasted for several decades, right? And U.S. Uh, uh, so the U. When Soviet uh, U. Uh, this was the era when Cold War was taking place, and uh, in order to counter uh, the uh, in order to counter the uh, uh, Soviets, U.S. Uh, put up uh, started supporting mujahideens who were the uh, who were uh, fighting the Soviet uh, the Russians or the Soviet forces. And that is when now Pakistan becomes a U.S. client state 
Pakistani uh, intelligence agency, ISI, is now heavily involved in uh, a, you know, arming and training uh, all the uh, Mujahideens. And uh, Mujahideens event, and, uh, uh, and Mujahideens are uh, basically battling uh, the, uh, the Soviets. So take it from there. So that you have to uh, you have to be outside mute. Yep, go ahead. What you see by now is uh, this in 1979, uh, 79 after the invasion of the Soviet Union, the Soviets basically put in their Marxist government in place. And in in the 1980s, you have Dr. Najibullah, uh, who who was you know actually a well-educated doctor uh, and and a communist, who took over control of Afghanistan. And during this period, billions of dollars were poured into Pakistan by both Islamic countries in, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia being one of them, and, uh, and as well as America. And America wanted to defeat Marxism in general. So they wanted to use Islamists to do that job. And so, you know, the, the, what was created was something called the Mujahideen, uh, which was basically Afghans and, and Muslims from all over the world fully radicalized, going to Pakistan and fighting this war against the Soviet army, as well as the Afghans who were on the side of the Soviet Union. Some of them were, most of them were very secular. So by, if you go to the next slide, by uh, 1988, the Soviet Union is losing in Afghanistan and they begin to withdraw. So Soviet Union itself as a country, uh, starts to, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a nation starts to disintegrate because now the Soviet republics are falling apart. And uh, and by this time, you, you see that uh, they have to leave Afghanistan because Soviet Union itself is collapsing. And by that time, the Mujahideen move into Afghanistan. They slowly capture city after city after city until they reach Kabul. So once they reach Kabul, the Mujahideen also splits because now you have, you know, these are Islamic fighters but the moment they win, then they start saying, okay, now I'm also a Tajik. I'm also a Uzbek. I'm also a Pashto. So now who controls amongst these Islamic fighters, the city of Kabul becomes a fight in itself. So you had uh, Jalaluddin Rabbani uh, uh, as one of the uh, leaders of the Mujahideen who controlled Kabul. But then you had a Pashto uh, speaking uh, pro-Pakistani Mujahideen guy named uh, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar who very brutally targeted Kabul and started attacking everywhere, the other Mujahideens. And then you had the Northern Alliance, which was basically non-Pashtun uh, Mujahideens, led by Ahmad Shah Massoud, who, who created this confederacy with uh, uh, you know Abdul Rashid Dostam, who was also, uh, I think he, Dostam was a Tajik. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. But... So Dostam and, and Northern Alliance, uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud created... He was, he was definitely from the Northern Alliance. He was from um, the... But I'm not sure whether he was he, a Tajik or a Uzbek. Uh, or Uzbek. I, I believe he was a Uzbek, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think Dostam was a Uzbek too. So, so Ahmad Shah Massoud was a Tajik and Dostam was a Uzbek and they created the Northern Alliance, which actually controlled most of the Panjshir Valley, which is one of the most fertile... You know, Afghanistan is a very <clears> dry <throat> and mountainous region, but it has fertile pockets where you can do good farming and uh, develop good crops. So Northern Alliance controlled the farming areas in the Panjshir Valley. And so there was a very brutal civil war between 1988 to 1992. And Pakistan began to lose its influence, even on the Mujahideen, which it had trained and, 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 and you know, given full support to with billions of dollars from all over the world for 10 years. So when Pakistan started fearing that it's losing control over the Mujahideen, it created a new Mujahideen. And that is what we know as the Taliban today. So the Taliban were Pashtun speaking Mujahideen, children of the Mujahideen who grew up in Pakistan, went to Islamic madrasas there, fully brainwashed, totally Islamized, complete nutcases in my opinion, who are not saying they're dumb, they're, they're nutcases in terms of their ideology. They're pretty smart people, I believe. Uh, and then Pakistan starts pushing in the Taliban into Afghanistan to defeat the Northern Alliance and take control of Kabul. And between 1992 to 1994, Taliban fully took control of most of Afghanistan, including areas of Kabul. 
and by 1996 taliban was fully in power in kabul and that marked one of the most dark periods in afghan history because within the next 3 4 years the taliban destroyed every hindu and buddhist monument that it can lay hands to there are hundreds of hindu hindu sculptures hindu deities who were in museums around afghanistan that were to- taken out and destroyed we would never know how much has been lost we mostly know about the bamiyan buddhas because they were so big and the taliban destroyed them in such a you know such a they t- took tanks and dynamites and blew them up so it it became a global spectacle but thousands of other hindu artifacts were lost in afghanistan during this period not just hindu artifacts the taliban true to their fundamentalist islamic beliefs banned the internet because internet was coming up as a thing in in the 90s all over the world they banned any movies they banned tv they banned music they every day the ta- uh, taliban would have they, they took over the stadiums all around afghanistan and anybody without a beard any man without a beard and any woman without a hijab complete burqa actually not even a hijab burqa it's not even hijab yeah hey, the, even the eyes were only partial yeah, uh, 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 actually there's a net so you can't even actually you know see through it fully but yeah. so so uh, all, that, both that, men and women were taken to the stadiums and publicly flogged so you know when the western world starts talking about <laughs> isis and what isis did in raqqa and, and and northern iraq and syria and what the, they were doing the same thing the taliban was doing the same thing in afghanistan 20 years ago before i so so, so let me let me just say this okay uh, so for people uh, you know a lot of times people say that you know why are we uh, you know uh, why are we so much uh, talking about hindu dharma and hindutva as a hindu way of life and all of that right i i think it's important to note what happens when a particular culture that was a hindu culture a dharmic culture uh is now taken over by one of the oppressive ideologies so when we wake up every day and we say that we are going to uh, work towards uh, the promotion or propagation or education about hindu dharma or dharmic philosophies this is what we are trying to preserve because the day the hindu dharma and hindu culture disappears from the from a region you end up with taliban and all our efforts are to protect the spiritual freedom which is much higher than political freedom once you preserve the spiritual freedom then you protect the cultural freedom you cult- uh, do you have the political freedom all of those follow from this kind of spiritual freedom it's the highest level of freedom where once you have that then you can say that okay now uh, people are free to choose people are free to choose the way they want to live and at the end of the day all the people uh, who uh, follow the hindu dharma who follow the hindutva philosophy and uh, who are hindu activist all they are really uh, working towards is creating a society where people have these kinds of freedoms and to prevent uh, groups like taliban and groups like isis from really taking over that is uh, so it's very important to note uh, and learn from history what happened to afghanistan what is happening to pakistan today if we uh, that is what really what you know we are trying to prevent okay uh, so uh, uh, please continue correct and 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 thank you ajay bhai for for that and uh, you know if you go if you go forward now so we are we are right now in taliban era and, and there will be you know most people by now are who who are following our presentation are now in touch with the news now so they know they remember what was happening in the late 90s and early 2000 three notable events the destruction of the bamiyan buddhas the forceful marking of hindus and sikhs hindus and sikhs were uh, forced to wear patches saffron colored patches on their hands to mark themselves just like the nazis marked the jews exactly like the nazis exactly and you so you start that starts happening and then you have september 11 and i think september 11 was the first time when the western world first realized 
what is happening in these regions of the world until all this time you know there was a great game there was but it was still far away from their shores and you know i remember back then people from india and indians would be trying to explain this what's happening how radical islam works and how taliban works and how al qaeda and all nobody would listen to us because people were like ah these are just some bunch of hindus you know maybe call them hindutva or whatever and then you know it's it's their problem now after september 11 suddenly america realizes the western world realizes western world realizes that now they are getting hit by this monster and that's when everything changes so america goes into afghanistan removes the taliban from power and and osama bin laden who was protected by afghanistan is now targeted and look so basically this begins a new phase and this is also the beginning of the 21st century you know it coincides yeah. with and uh, uh, new- afghanistan is basically uh, you know uh, a center for uh, you know uh, a center and a training ground for all the people who want to take over the world and, and yeah and and you know interestingly 1989 was also the time when the soviet union left afghanistan and it coincides with the time that jammu and kashmir in india begins to flare up with thousands of radical islamists pakistanis uh, afghans because now all these mujahideens are jobless so what pakistan is doing now is they are pushing those mujahideens into india because lo behold there are 1.1 billion hindus in india and for for an islamist just the existence of one hindu is a problem i mean you can see as, as we went through the timeline continuously there was attacks after attacks it's a wave after wave after wave generation after generation the entire effort has been to conquer and convert conquer and convert so suddenly after the 1989 uh, withdrawal of soviet union and and establishment of mujahideen power in afghanistan you have thousands of these islamists not cases fully trained at the behest of the uh, pakistan army and the pakistan intelligence waiting to be sent to fight in other battles and lo behold you have chechnya you have bosnia you have kashmir all these start coming up because now all these mujahideen jih- jihadis are going to different parts of the world and start attacking people and killing non muslims so this coincides with the genocide that the last phase of the genocide that started happening in jammu and kashmir in 1989 fast forward to 2003 2004 you have what is called the american uh, presence in afghanistan because of which you know the taliban was pushed but it was still there in pakistan because america hindsight might be 2020 and 20 years down the road i think the biggest regret that most world powers will have looking back at 2001 and the decade after that is that instead of just going to afghanistan the americans should have also gone into pakistan because that's where the actual taliban and its base and the jihadis were and for the last 20 well, years, you, know, you know look at it i mean you know uh, where was osama bin laden found he was sitting 20 km not even 20 km from the pakistani uh, army headquarters in rawal near rawal pindi um exactly. i mean you know, i i don't even think it was 20 km it's probably much closer than that it was 2 and 1/2 uh, km ajay bhai not 2 and 1/2 km i was <laughs> off by order of magnitude uh, but so sir so, building it is literally like you can stand on the top of osama bin laden and you can see the uh, in rawal pindi and you can see the pakistani military uh, yeah, army yeah, headquarters yeah. from from the top yeah. of the and and so these are the uh, so so i think i you're absolutely right the biggest mistake america made is not at that time confront pakistan america still thought that pakistan can be trusted as a friend or or an ally or a supporter in the cause against the extremist in afghanistan whereas pakistan every step of the step of the way till today undermines the american policy by talking uh, from two sides of its mouth and i think finally i i have a feeling that america is beginning to understand not fully yet not fully yet but i think a little bit and one of the reasons i say that is because biden has still not met with uh, pakistani prime minister imran khan and uh, despite a lot of effort by imran khan to actually get on his schedule that has not happened because america is holding off till they are convinced that hey look uh, you know uh, are you really on our side but pakistan has its own game Pakistan and now China is coming in the picture and we should talk about it a little bit 
like it is no longer just a game or uh, no longer just a uh, you know a, a strategic uh, interest of the us but because of the uh, the cpac and the uh, ro- you know belt and roads policy and all of that uh, the new silk road that china is building uh, pakistan and china have become allies uh, china wants to get into afghanistan for multiple reasons and i can go over some of them and now so it's a much bigger game and that is one of the that is really the reason why uh, pakistan can still not be trusted well uh, ajay bhai what what i i you know pakistan's approach towards america and the global powers in afghanistan can be summarized with the quote from mullah umar and mullah umar was the you know spiritual and the overall head of taliban for most of its existence he 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 was killed in the recent past but mullah umar very appropriately and this is basically how the isi thought so he was basically articulating what the pakistani establishment and the military thought mullah umar when asked about the american control of afghanistan said he was asked this question and he replied saying the americans have the watches we have the time so so you know pakistan literally followed that to the hill they degraded america's military capabilities went after young american men and women killed more than 2 and 1/2 thousand of america's ch- you know american women and children uh, men and women were killed by pakistan in afghanistan more than 2 and 1/2 thousand of them and there were thousands of afghans who were killed because pakistan believed and and it's it's right in because it has been proved right that they will just wear down the americans and slowly kick them out of afghanistan using the taliban and pakistan succeeded so now we are at a time where the world is remembering what the taliban did between 1994 and 2000 what we are worrying now is what is going to happen next in afghanistan because i don't know if people in india are worrying about it but i'm pretty sure india thinks what is worrying about what's going to happen in jammu and kashmir because i can guarantee you that Pakistan is going to replay the same game it played in the 1980s by bringing back all these jihadis that are now in <coughs> Afghanistan if Afghanistan falls i i don't know if it's going to fall anytime soon because afghans are also learned their lessons and they are going to they are going to make taliban pay before anything bad happens to kab in kabul uh, but pakistan is waiting to go after india again because it it has it has the same playbook in its mind so uh, so that let me uh, let me systematically kind of go over the impact uh, that america leaving is going to have on the region and rest of the people and, uh, and including afghanistan so i think at some point uh, and right now taliban uh, occupy 50% of the territory so i think i would make the first uh, guess i would make is that at some point after america leaves in september which is not that far away uh there will be intense battle uh to uh, to control the rest of the 50% urban areas are controlled by the afghan forces rural areas by the taliban and the rural areas of taliban will uh, will see the rise of the kind of taliban rule that previously existed whatever the second so the impact on the women especially in taliban occupied territories is going to be horrific to say the least um and the taste that the uh, taste of freedom that they had uh, for last 30 years is going to be gone and the next generation is going to suffer like the previous generation when taliban ruled for a few years the second impact it will have is on the what are remaining hindu and sikh minorities in uh, in afghanistan now there are only about 200 of them left and or uh, you know maybe a few uh, you know a few more and the impact on them is going to be i i don't even know if they can survive that so that the impact is going to be uh, you know uh, so detrimental and if if i were to say that if they were to not leave afghanistan they will be targeted in the worst possible way and uh, this is where we tie into the uh you know the caa the constitutional amendment act that india brought out which is to give refuge to people who followed the uh, hindu 
uh, Jain, Sikh, Buddhist traditions in the surrounding countries in India and to bring them uh, to India in an expedited, uh, you know, accelerated residency, permanent residency and citizenship. Um, there is a demand that came out of yesterday where uh, Canada said that they want to bring all the people who acted, all the Afghans who acted as translators. Uh, the World Sikh Organization, which is a Canadian Sikh body, actually asked this Canadian government to include the Hindus and Sikhs in this also. So can, can, the, the World Sikh Organization is now advocating that Canada adopt a, a, you know something similar to India CAA to bring these refugees from Canada. The third, uh, 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 the U.S. itself uh, has provisions. And if you remember last year, uh, Biden, when he was running for president, uh, pre president, advocated that Hindus and Sikhs be given prioritized admission in, to America because they are facing a life and death situation. So I think uh, so. That, so the, the next impact is on uh, the, uh, the Hindus and Sikhs. The third impact with Soda is on the drug trade. So you can imagine uh, the how does a Taliban survive? Taliban survives by growing opium over there and other drugs. So really, the next impact is uh, in uh, the uh, in increase in the drug trade and the impact that drug trade is actually going to have in places not just in the Western countries but in the Indian state of Punjab and other parts of India where uh, Pakistani ISI has been pushing drugs now for a, a decade or more. So the next impact is on uh, places in India like Punjab, uh, where the drug trade is going to flourish. And finally, Utsoda, uh, you know, various regions of India, starting with Jammu and Kashmir, the Union Territories, and Ladakh, it's going to have a tremendous impact, adverse, adverse impact, because once again, uh, Pakistan is not only going to treat Afghanistan as a strategic extension, but it is also going to treat uh, Afghanistan, uh, the fighters in Afghanistan, once they uh, achieve a certain amount, degree of success, and migrate them or, or kind of strategically move them to fight uh, the Pakistani cause or Islamic cause in Jammu and Kashmir uh, Union territories. So, uh, and, and then once you go there, there are other things also. With China involved, Pakistan is also looking at Afghanistan as a gateway to Central Asian Republic. So several of them, like Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all of these, uh, you know, the, uh, the former Soviet, uh, you know, the for former Soviet uh, territories, which are now republics. And that gives uh, Pakistan an entry to that. It gives China an entry to that because China has uh, now gets access to the uh, mines and minerals and other places in those areas, and part becomes part of the border, uh, you know, the border, uh, the uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative that China has. So all of these things are now coming together. Now India had a counter to that, and that was uh, the uh, the deal that India made with Iran. Uh, so that India has a passageway to Afghanistan, uh, bypassing the roads uh, that go through, uh, you know, the uh, uh, through Pakistan, as part of the CPEC project, which is part of again uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative by China. But India, so India countered that using a port in uh, Iran and a, and a, 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 and building a highway that uh, goes to Afghanistan through Iran. But so the uh, a few months ago, Iran and uh, China have now signed a strategic partnership. So again, India gets cornered. India also uh, had worked on uh, providing uh, infrastructure support to Afghanistan, building dams, building the build parliament building, providing educational funds. There are thousands of Afghanis who are studying in India. 18,000 have studied so far or some number like that, 15, 18,000. 3,000 are currently students. Scholarship for women. There are thousands of women studying in India, providing medical facilities, building hospitals. Now, Pakistan is especially targeting even a dam that is built by India. Yeah. And they're firing motors there. So this is the political situation right now in Afghanistan, where Indian interest 
and Hindu interests are, uh, you know, are being, uh, you know, are, are coming under attack. So if you start from the impact on uh, the women in Afghanistan, the minorities in Afghanistan, the infrastructure in Afghanistan, the interest of India in that region, interest of America, uh, American interest in that region, I think unless the Afghan forces hold off the consequences or unless we find a way as America, as India to provide some kind of tactical support to the government in Afghanistan, I think the future is pretty bleak. What do you think? No, I agree with you. I, I completely agree with you, Ajay And I think uh, what I'm pretty sure India is thinking about it, but thinking and acting are two different things. And, you know, what happens, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, basically. So what happens now is we have to we have to reevaluate the entire approach that India had in the last 20 years. The investments that India had in Afghanistan, and believe me, every Afghan that I have known and spoken to, they love what India has done in Afghanistan. India has brought schools, India has brought education to the women, India has brought power, India has brought roads, you know, things that make people's lives better. And, and Pakistan has brought blood, death, and more destruction. And that is all they have gifted to Afghanistan in the last 20 years. And uh, and it's, it's a, you know, the, the reason why I went into this long history is because this is something that we have to look at very seriously. We have to understand that this is part of a 2000 years of evolution that we are going to be involved in and how we act and deal with the radical Islamists now is going to impact the world for the next thousand years. So that's that's a very important you know takeaway from this even uh, discussion. Absolutely, and in, and uh, you know China is uh, you know creating trouble for India in uh, in Ladakh area, and that also plays into this. I mean these are all interconnected geopolitical issues. Uh, so that I, I, there's one more impact that we should talk about, and that is the impact on um, Balochistan. Now, Balochistan is a province of Pakistan, right? But uh, Balochistan also borders Afghanistan. And uh, not just Balochistan, but also Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, so these are the two regions of Pakistan that actually border Afghanistan. Last time... Uh, around when Taliban ruled and when Mujahideen took over Afghanistan, Taliban ruled Afghanistan, there were, uh, you know, uh, millions of uh, uh, Afghans who took refuge in Pakistan. But if you really think about it, the present day boundary between Afghanistan and Balochistan and Pakistan is what is defined by what is called the Durand Line, which is a line that was drawn on paper by Pakistan, uh, by British. British. Now, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Utsoda, the Durand line uh, had a lifespan of 100 years. Those 100 years have now expired. Okay, So there is no real treaty that defines the boundary between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Correct. And there are Pashtuns living on both sides of the border. As much as Pakistan would love to uh, so uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, preserve the boundary the way it is. The Taliban, even the Taliban that are trained by Pakistan, are not agreeing to that boundary. So Pakistan went and built over the last two or three years. Pakistan built a fence, and uh, in the last week, Pakistan actually started putting uh, instead of the levies forces and other uh, paramilitary uh, border forces, they started putting the actual army in the last four days. So because now Pakistan is concerned that, you know, you can only uh, you can only control uh, Taliban to a certain extent. Taliban are going to not just, uh, you know, uh, you know, potentially take over Afghanistan, but they're going to take over the part of the Pakistan that is Pashtun speaking. And beyond that, the ideology that Taliban adheres to has the potential of influencing the Pakistani army because Pakistan cannot tame the tiger. Pakistan has uh, infused so much fundamentalism in its in, in the country and in the army 
that at some point so that at some point uh, they are going to you know uh, they are going to uh, uh, basically say that you know why is pakistan not being governed by talibans so that is so now it things are not as even though pakistan may think that it is in the driver's seat and is controlling a taliban but if you really look into the future uh you know the, the prognosis for pakistan is not as good if pakistan is thought that the time when zia governed them zia ul haq the former president who is credited or discredited will bringing uh, you know a, a order of magnitude more islamization in pakistan well, if that was bad wait till taliban takes over pakistan well i i i disagree with you a little bit uh, ajay ji because i personally believe and and there are people you know i i agree there are lots of people out there who would fully agree with you i i slightly disagree with you because i believe that even though taliban on paper and through their actions looks more regressive in terms of their islamic beliefs and their their approach towards dealing with uh, you know applying sharia law and all those you know the outer uh, facade of islamism that taliban follows my personal understanding is that pakistan army and the isi and the pakistani establishment may look more westernized in terms of how they look you know they will wear a suit and a tie and you know speak in oxford english uh, but in their minds and when they look at things both at a strategic level at a civilizational level and at a tactical level they are as islamist if not more than the taliban so so an assumption that pakistan will face a situation where the taliban would want to take over afghanistan uh, over pakistan is is real but the scenario in my opinion is not something that pakistan is fully and uh, not aware of they have checks and balances in place they may have situations where they will be renegade you know taliban commanders who will you know like the ttp you know they will have some mahsood here and some other guy there going nuts over trying to kill some pakistanis and trying to take control of their own areas within the uh, south of the duran line but i do not think pakistan uh, will be in a situation where Tal- they face a real threat from taliban other than a war of slight tactical war of attrition uh, instead yeah. i believe ajay bhai i believe that pakistan would like before many times before use this threat that you just pointed out about further radicalization of its elements within its uh, establishment to extract more money from the west so they will that use, will happen yeah they will use yeah. the threat again, again they will be like look even the indians are saying that we face a threat from taliban imagine america what will happen if the nuclear weapons fall in the hands of taliban give me more money give me more money give me more money and that's what they will yeah do. i i i agree with that but i also think that i see personally i see uh, fishers within pakistani army and that is more dangerous so even the outward right now the you know uh, the condition of women condition of minorities that exist in pakistan which is very bad extremely bad and we'll talk about it more next week because we have a special coming up next week but um, even despite of that i mean the talibanization of pakistan the outward the way uh, the you know you talked about the soccer fields and stadiums and how the people were treated that level of radicalization of pakistan uh, with the support of the radical elements in pakistani army uh, is you know is is taking it just to a different level and so that i i just think that you know uh, this is something uh, uh, this is something that is just you know going to happen i i think pakistani army can forcibly try to preserve balochistan and parts of khyber pakhtunkhwa from uh, falling into the hands of taliban because they are a superior military force compared to taliban but if if uh pakistani army uh, uh, you know b- uh, become you know uh, has fissures in it where a lot of people start believing in this uh, talibani ideology that pakistan you know engineered to begin with um i think i i i think that rest of the pakistan places like sindh uh, will be you know uh, uh, will have you know they will have uh, they will have difficult times in places like sindh so i have a feeling that uh, if at some point uh pakistan does not curtail uh 
its involvement with the uh, with Taliban, you can just see that uh, Pakistan itself gets engulfed um, in in uh, Talibani uh, you know uh, you know philosophy and Talibani way of life. I I I myself think that there there will be increasing radicalization in Pakistan. It's it's happening in every Islamic country. I mean, look at the pictures of uh, Afghanistan from 50 years ago, and you will see the the way Afghans used to live their lives and compare it to now. So there is Islamization happening in every Islamic country and in non-Islamic country uh, within the Muslim populations. But I I still believe that Pakistan sees see Pakistan is an expert at brinkmanship and the madman gambit. That's why, you know, as much as many people didn't like President Trump and didn't uh, expect much from President Trump in terms of uh, countering and dealing with Pakistan, one thing that Pakistan could not do with President Trump was playing madman gambit because President Trump was an expert in that himself. So Pakistan is an expert in playing brinkmanship and madman gambit. And they just failed in front of President Trump because President Trump is like, you can't beat me in my own game. But the other establishment state apparatuses in Western countries, including and even in, in India as well, uh, are far more far less capable of dealing with Madman Gambit the way Pakistan plays it. And that's why, you know, I believe that Pakistan will continue to est- extract more from the world by playing this Madman Gambit. I think the only country where Pakistan will actually feel challenged will be its own bosses and own masters in China. Because China doesn't fall for those games that the Western countries fall for. China will extract yeah. its copper and its, uh, you know, it, whatever it can. From, from, whatever it can, yeah. And, and then they, they, they will just say goodbye. And, China has a very different way of dealing with this. Yeah. Um, and, and so let, let's see how it plays out. So the great conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And today we had a lot of participation from people who joined. But don't go away yet because now comes the interesting part because we do have our regularly scheduled segments and you will want to stand for that. But before that, so that uh, I have a video that was created by uh, Vanna Sharmaji who is uh, watching and a great video and I'm going to share that and this is about the Hindu Pak Gala that is coming up. It's a few sec- uh, it's a couple of minutes video, uh, absolutely worth watching and what a great job. I mean, she is an amazing, amazing artist. So uh, we are so privileged that she is able to do uh, these kinds of, uh, you know, videos for us. So also that let me play uh, this uh, promo video for Hindu Pak Gala, uh, Hindu Pak being the, uh, you know, uh, the initiative of World Hindu Council of America and in, this Hindu Lounge show is brought to you by Hindu Pack and this is the video. So please let me know if you can watch the video and hear the sound. Loading. I think uh, the, there is no music, uh, no, no sound, Ajay Bhai. Uh, I think that's because if we are having the same problem we had in the morning. Your sound is from from your screen, you know, where, where you I, are. Okay, I, I think I got it. I, I think I, I see the problem here. Oh, this is a slightly different problem, but nonetheless, I have a, I think I got it. Let's just give me a second. Otherwise, we'll have to do it next time, but uh, let me, let me do this. Let me know if you can hear it now. I don't hear it, Ajay. No, no, it's not playing yet. How about now? No, it's also uh, moving in in, uh, in jerks. So, I think we should we should probably just play it uh, separately or give people a link to go to. Because yeah, what... I'll, we'll play it separately. But you know, I'll do a voiceover a little bit. Uh, this is uh, the gala that is coming up on twenty second of August. Uh, we have we are going to highlight our Chingari project. We'll talk about that next time. There's also a dance drama that is coming up. And we are also going to talk about the achievements uh, and triumphs of Hindu Pak, many uh, of which there are many. And we will also uh, have esteemed guests, including Arif Ajakia, who was one of the mayors of a city in Pakistan, and people re- representing different faiths. And they will talk about uh, how Hindu dharma has been uh, instrumental in uh, you know, in bringing other faiths together. So that is the uh, that is the show and that is the gala that is coming up. It is a fundraising gala. So we are going to request everyone to contribute generously to Hindu Pack. 
and the uh, causes that we espouse. Uh, with that, Usada, I go to the, uh, again, I don't know if this will be, uh, 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 this is, uh, you know, uh, this we talked about in the beginning. Uh, there is a Hindu PAC, uh, uh, we have an initiative called American Hindus Against Defamation. We are partnering with Dharma Civilization Foundation. We have a webinar tonight. Uh, on anti-Semitism and what Hindu and Hindu phobia parallels, and what we can learn as Hindus from 200 years of anti-Semitism history in America. Uh, it's a great follow-on show to the last um, uh, last webinar that we had, where we had a Holocaust survivor. Uh, please watch the same channels you are watching. Uh, there's also if you can go to hindupack.org. There's a link to register. But otherwise, you can watch it on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on the same channels that you're watching this show, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 5 o'clock Pacific. Uh, so the, the next one on my list is the first of the uh, Hindu good news of the week. So the, uh, this is a Skanda uh, Murti. And this was looted from Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia, as you know, was a Hindu country. And, uh, you know, during the civil war, a lot of things uh, got looted from Cambodia. So this was one of the things that was looted uh, from Cambodia. And this particular murti, uh, masterpiece, is being, uh, a, 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 you know, the U.S. wants to now return to Cambodia. So this came in the art news, and it just came a few days ago. Uh, and I, I'm glad that these stolen art pieces are now being returned. Uh, some are being returned to India, some are being returned to Nepal, some are being returned to countries like Cambodia. But I think, you know, these kind of colonial theft, uh, you know, uh, should not survive. And people were looting murtis from India uh, you know, till recently. And even now that happens once in a while. And we should we should all be vigilant about this. Uh, these are important cultural uh, you know markers for any civilization, and it cannot just be looted like this. Uh, so that unless you have any comments, I do have the next video, and hopefully the sound will play on this one. Let's hope so at least. Uh, can you hear the sound? I don't. So I think there is a problem with sharing this in this particular uh, uh, software that we are using. There is a problem with sharing a sound from PowerPoint. And we have not, I thought there was a setting that I, I set up so that it would share the sound. But for some reason, we're not able to share the sound. So uh, it is one of those things that we will improve upon next time around. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can say, uh, I, you know, and I also realized that, uh, you know, uh, for some reason, uh, yeah, we love to, we love to figure it out. So I don't know, uh, I don't know why, because we really had uh, some good sounds and I also realized that um, the, uh, the video on my end was, you know, I had deteriorated from the very high resolution to a slightly lower resolution. Um, but in any case, this was our regular Hindu Seva Charity Act of the Week. Uh, once again, I want to say that the COVID third wave is likely to come. India is gearing up for that. Uh, U.S. is gearing up for that. And so please, uh, this week again, we urge you to go to vhp-america.org and donate to uh, World Hindu Council of America's COVID effort, relief efforts. Okay, so please go to uh, vhp-america.org and donate to World Hindu Council of America. Uh, so that I, I think uh, the next one uh, on my list is your favorite, um, and that is the Hindu phobe of the week. So Utsada, go for go for it. Uh, tell us about uh, the Hindu phobe of the week. Uh, Ajay, could you show show the screen? I think we are still at the at the screen showing the Hindu Seva charities. Uh, yep, I am just going there. I, I want to just see if this works. Let's see. Can you hear the sound? No. All right. 
All right, let's do that. So the Hindu Hindu phobe of the week is this a uh, particular pastor who uh, as a give pastor is a bad name, but he's uh, in uh, well, he's uh, and I, I'm gonna, I, and he's, he, what is that? As as the name suggests, he's just trying to appeal to the sheep. I am going to. I I have some quotes, and I have some quotes that will. I you know I so that every time we come to these kinds of people, right? I'm always kind of you know I I'm never quite sure whether to laugh or you can smile or what do you do? I mean, with people like this. So first, uh, so first, uh, you know, this guy is from. His name is George. Ponaya he is a he is a catholic priest he is from uh, uh panna velai uh, uh, in K- kanyakumari okay so remember the name his name is george ponaya and this is these are the statements that he made uh, so gandhi is not mahatma gandhi he is a, a bjp uh, he is a bjp mla who just recently got uh, elected so this george ponaya says that gandhi isn't wearing chappal because the, uh, gandhi does not wear chappal because bharat mata should not be stomped on and then he goes on to say but we wear shoes we as he and his uh, fellow bigots uh, wear shoes because we don't want our but the impurities in the bharat mata to stain us stain us tamil nadu government distributes free chappal so that we don't get uh, scabies from bhumi bhuma devi Okay, insulting the Hindu goddess Bhuma Devi Dharti Mata. Bhuma Devi is dangerous person. You'll get scabies and psoriasis from her. That's why you should wear chappals. Okay, this is how he insults Hindu dharma. He spoke of Naxal sympathizer. Now this is the guy who just recently passed away. We talked about him two weeks ago. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Stan Swami or Stanless Lord Swami, who was arrested by NIA for inciting riots. Okay, this is a Nak- urban naxal inciting riots and uh, he, uh, and he is saying that uh, 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 that lord swami or stan swami will receive nobel prize as even the un has condemned modi and advised one of his laity to name his son after stan, stan Sam- swami so george punaya has advised one of his uh, laity to name the son after stan swami and he said that un's condemnation was like other countries spitting on modi and amit shah okay leave the politics aside he he further talked about the numbers have grown in kanyakumari now this is the conversion by force fraud inducement that we always talk about and grown from 42% to 62% and and in majority now will go to 70% in a few days and will continue to grow now i, I don't know if these numbers are right or wrong but he is pointing to the fact that he can actually get funds and he can uh, connive in some way or the other with uh, other people to convert uh, you know uh, a majority of the people there uh, to christianity he says you cannot stop us i want to issue this as a warning to our hindu brethren so he is warning hindus hey i'm coming after you okay and then he derides the archakas these are the pujaris of the temple by saying don't think pastors are just like pujaris who ring the bell we are well educated okay i'm sophisticated you guys you guys are you know uh you know uh, you guys are uh, uh, uh country bumpkins you don't know anything about you know uh, you're not as sophisticated i with my uh, western education and i with my uh, western faith am much more sophisticated and educated as you than you don't forget the chappal ajay bhai don't forget the chappal that he's wearing <laughs> don't forget the chappal right and he yeah. also accused the government of doing injustice as and kami uh, he says Modi's last day will be pitiable if it is true that God we worship is alive. Then history will see Modi and Shah's corpses being feasted on by dogs and maggots. This is a religious leader. This is a person who is supposed to be compassionate towards others, and he is supposed to follow the compassion that Bible preaches. But what no, happened he's, to him? He's, he's 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 taking a leaf out of the Old Testament, Ajay. Right? There is wrath and anger in Old Testament. Let's let's not fool ourselves. and uh, so yeah he's he's just digging into that a little bit it's it's just his his But, way of I, you know so the, i think the world has kind of moved on and i you know i think uh, the message of compassion in christianity 
is what the world uh, you know counts on and i think this guy is uh, really uh, a complete bigot oh i agree with you i agree with you and i i'm pretty sure most many christians would completely disagree with him but uh, you know the, he's he's just he's just to digging into a, a darker place in his heart i guess <laughs> that works for him all right so that with that i i wish i, I you know i had a better way of doing this but i we come to an end i'm still going to play the music i think the music will play because it's a powerpoint sharing of uh, music that was not working so we are we are still going to say uh, play the music so i want to show this one picture also the and i i just i talk about it next time a little bit more but this you know the desi bell uh, creates custom music for us every week for a special music for our show and i want to show you the kind of setup they have just to create a custom music for our show so that this is i it's just amazing take a look at this this is a home studio um and you can see a, a big keyboard on this side and you can see all the equipment and everything else this is the studio where our, our custom music for hindu lounge gets created every single week this is amazing i you know this i know what the quality and the kind of uh, music that we get every week is just uh, beyond belief i mean it's just absolutely amazing and so i cannot thank decibels enough and for uh, you know they have now done 25 of these and so thank you desi bells uh, once again for the bottom of our come on our show and 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 we would be very happy to have them on our show I mean, they have done a fantastic job in making our show so much better so thank I, you and i absolutely absolutely with that so that we come to a long show today we almost had an 2 hour and 3 uh, minute show uh i know you enjoyed it uh, uh and i i did too i'm just saying but and we had a lot of participation from people today so uh so the uh, thank you thank you very much this was a great great show i cannot thank you enough for spending all this time and doing a lot of research so uh thank you again and uh, thank you everyone for joining vanna ji thank you very much amitabh ji thank you dhawal bhai thank you and mudita ji thank you um and everyone else Sar- sanatani uh, thank you all of you guys who joined today thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts this is hindu lounge hindu lounge is brought to you by hindu pack uh, an initiative of world in council of america i am ajay shah and with me as always is utsav chakrabarti utsav final words for you before I, we move on to the uh, desi bell special tune well thank you everybody from for coming and uh, hope to see you again next week and uh, you know Take care and uh, follow the news. A special show next week. Next week is a special show, and we will announce that show during the week. And and help us support us so that we can do more of this and share our content and 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 you know just join us next week again. All right. Thank you, Sada. And stay stay tuned for uh, stay tuned for Desi Bell's uh, special tune uh, just for this episode. and here we go hey.